I just achieved a lifelong goal. Yes, yes, yes. Oh my gosh. I cannot express how happy I am right now. That is a red flash. I have just made synthetic opal. Hi everyone, this video is going to be awesome. If I can communicate half the excitement that I myself have about this project, I'll have done my job today and this will be a really enjoyable watch. We are going to make opal, synthetic opal in the workshop. It's the only stone I know of that is not the color that it seems to be. This is a project that I have dreamed about since I was a little kid. I read about this process somewhere in the back of a book or a magazine. Just a brief description about how someone discovered how to make them in their backyard shed. And not much more detail than that. I didn't have the resources at the time to look into this further. It was a secret, of course, because making a gemstone is a very valuable thing to know. However, more recently, a lot of papers have been published on this subject, including one excellent video by another YouTube channel called The Thought Emporium. Now, this channel actually did most of the research that was required for me to tackle this project, and so I'm really thankful for you out there. The Thought Emporium, you're an awesome channel. Thanks for including all the links to your research. This is going to be very helpful. I am going to actually be using this process for more than just creating a beautiful stone. Opal, if you don't know, is an incredibly beautiful, precious gemstone that can take on all the colors of the rainbow. And so just for that reason alone, I'm excited to try this. But more importantly, this actually has a lot to do with the series that I already have in progress. That is the creation of radiative cooling coatings. Coatings that can send their energy off into space and become colder than ambient air temperature without any extra energy input. You literally could use this technology for free air conditioning. It's amazing. And the creation of opals plays into this. So, the creation of synthetic opal requires some dangerous chemicals. Actually, really just one quite dangerous chemical, and that is glove. <laughs> yeah. All right. The dangerous chemical we will be using today is called TEOS, tetraethyl orthosilicate, which is a liquid compound of silicon. Almost all the compounds of silicon that we would encounter in everyday life are very solid. Actually, I only know of one, silicon dioxide, and we see a lot of that as sand or glass in windows. Glass and sand are both primarily silicon dioxide, and so are opals. And so we can use this liquid compound to form an opal. The only problem is that this liquid is very ready to turn back into that solid silicon dioxide, and it will happily do so in your eyes or in your lungs. Basically, you breathe this stuff in, it's gonna turn into sand in your lungs, which I'm generally told is quite bad for your health. Hence the fume hood, the gloves, the glasses, and this being a project that you should not try at home. Now, it's interesting that glass and sand and opal are all made of the same chemical, but they look very different. Glass, of course, is transparent, and sand, if it's very pure, is white. Actually, if you zoomed in on sand, it would be transparent just like the glass is. Now, being that this is the same compound as an ordinarily transparent chemical, how does this work? How does opal make all of these colors? Opal is actually a very particular arrangement of nanospheres of silicon dioxide. It's basically a bunch of orderly layers of marbles, very, very small glass marbles. What happens when light enters these structures is that some wavelengths will constructively interfere, giving you a big bright flash of color. It basically amplifies certain wavelengths and then it destroys others. Other wavelengths will destructively interfere. A peak of a wavelength will meet the valley of another one and when they meet, they crash together and you get nothing. Light is really weird. The point of all this is that in order to make a synthetic opal, what we're really looking for is a recipe for very, very small glass marbles. And that's what this paper is. Uh, this paper goes into detail about a process to chemically make these silicon dioxide nanospheres in solution. This was kindly dug up by the Thought Emporium for his video on synthetic opal, 
and I'll place a link in my video description as well so you can take a look for yourself. This has several methods for making microspheres or nanospheres of various sizes, which are suitable for reflecting particular wavelengths of visible light. Actually, you could make opals that amplify light way outside of the visible spectrum, on either end, either in the ultraviolet or infrared range. We'll have to talk about that later. First, let's make some visible spectrum reflecting opals so that we can get that bright color flash and see the full beauty of this synthetic stone. So the basis of this reaction is to take our liquid silica compound here, this TEOS, and react it in a solution of ethanol. Super pure ethanol. This is 200 proof. Uh, I had to go online to buy this and it's denatured, so hopefully whatever they use to make this non-drinkable isn't going to interfere with this reaction. Time will tell. Uh, we're gonna react the TEOS in ethanol with a catalyst of ammonia. This is 10% janitorial strength ammonia, and the paper calls for 25%. So that's where this is gonna get thrown off, and I might have to play with the ratios a bit to find the, uh, the similar results as this paper reports. So let's start off with 41 milliliters of ethanol in this beaker. Actually, first things first, I decided I have these giant containers of chemicals and I don't want to risk contaminating my entire supply by dipping syringes in and out of the whole bottle. So I'm pouring my chemicals into smaller containers to separate it up a little bit. So the chemical reaction used in this paper is volume dependent. You make different sizes of silicon dioxide nanospheres depending on how much ethanol you use. So I'm gonna start out the first reaction using 41 milliliters of ethanol. And theoretically this should make particles that are about 400 nanometers across. We'll find out if that's accurate or not. That should be on the far end of the visible spectrum. And to this, I will add 20 milliliters of my ammonia solution. So I have my ethanol and ammonia now stirring away in this beaker and the hot plate is turned on. And I'm watching this temperature waiting for it to get up to 60 degrees Celsius. At that point, we can add our TEOS. This is actually an extremely simple chemical reaction. Just the two ingredients, ethanol and ammonia, before you add the TEOS and you have to have it at the right temperature. When we add the TEOS, the ammonia will allow it to convert back into silicon dioxide, hopefully in the form of nanospheres and of a very specific size. It should only be a matter of minutes before we start noticing a change. Maybe a matter of seconds. <laughs> that, <laughs> That is what is called opalescence. <laughs> that is an opalescent property. It looks milky. Um, milk itself actually has some opalescent properties. But if I take a flashlight and I shine it behind this, what does that look like? Let me do this camera. One of the easiest tests that we can do to see if we have succeeded in making nanoparticles is to put a sample of our solution in front of a bright light. <laughs> if the sample turns red, as you can see it is here toward the edges where the light can pass through it, that is called Rayleigh scattering. A solution of nanoparticles scatters all light except for the longest wavelength, so the red, the red spectrum. You can tell that the particle count in the air is a lot higher, by the way, when the sun sets are particularly red because, well, those additional nanoparticles in the air, whether from smoke, wildfires, or what have you, they turn the sky a deeper red when the sun is passing through them at a low angle. Awesome. All right, the sample has had plenty of time to dry and I do not see any, I do not see any visible color flash. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that we were unsuccessful, at least not, not totally unsuccessful. Uh, we could have successfully made opal that reflects light in a non-visible spectrum. It could be reflecting the infrared or the ultraviolet. To find out which, we'll have to throw this under the microscope. All right, we can see these particles under the microscope. I think that they are too small to be able to tell whether or not they are spherical 
The optical limit for a microscope is about 200 nanometers. Particles smaller than that can be seen as a blurry speck, but the limit means that you can't make out the shape or any details. However, you can see interactions between nanoparticles. It looks like film grain as they pass by each other and clump together. And so you can actually make a fairly good guess of particle size by the coarseness of the grain. These seem smaller than 200 nanometers, maybe a lot smaller. We're looking for particles between the sizes of 100 and 400 nanometers in size. I think what we have to do is repeat this and try to make the particles larger. Yeah, let's give that a shot. Nanoparticle lesson time. I've found in my past experiments making micro and nanoparticles that the most important factor in controlling their size is controlling how many nucleation sites are in your solution. Nucleation sites are basically a disturbance in the chemical fluids that allows a crystal to start forming. The more nucleation sites you have, the more crystals you will have, and that will limit the size of their growth. They're kind of like uh, hungry people at a buffet. If you have 20 people sharing the buffet, they'll divide the food equally and they'll only get so big. If there's only one person at a buffet of the same size, that person will be able to grow quite large. <laughs> basically, the nucleation sites have to share the chemical solutions between them. So if we make a ton of nucleation sites, we'll have very small crystals. The nucleation sites are actually provided by the ethanol. And so by adding more or less ethanol, we're increasing or decreasing the amount of nucleation sites in this solution. A silica particle can actually start nucleating off of a molecule of ethanol. So we have already made particles that I think are too small. Reduce the ethanol, we'll end up with bigger particles. So for the last reaction, we used 41 milliliters of ethanol. What I'm going to try for this one is half of that. Actually, I'll just round it down to 20 milliliters. We'll add this to our beaker. And get this stirring. And then we'll add the ammonia. This will be unadjusted. We'll still use 20 milliliters of this. And when it comes time to add the TEOS, we will also leave that unadjusted. We'll use the full six milliliters that we used before, and we'll see how this turns out. All right, it's pretty quickly hitting that opalescent state. Are we seeing any Rayleigh scattering yet? I think we are. So our handy little instruction manual here says to let this continue reacting for the next two hours. I think that is a little excessive. I do have a lot of experience making microspheres specifically, and I think that this should pretty much be done after about 20 minutes at most. It should be a lot less critical after the very first parts of this reaction to do things like maintain the temperature and the stirring speed. Once you already have all your nucleation sites and you're really not generating that many more, well, the spheres are gonna be the size that they're gonna be. All right, I can't stand it any longer. Let's get a sample here and let it dry out on this slide. Well, this sample is drying. Let me go grab the microscope and we'll take a look and see if I was right about making particles of a larger size. <laughs> There's one stray glob floating by one larger size sphere. The rest are still enormously small. Oh my goodness, are they small. I don't believe it. The particles are even smaller than the last ones. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense based on what's in this paper. It doesn't make sense based on what I know about nanoparticle chemistry myself. AENG3 volumes, 50, 100, and 150 ml of the solution were selected for comparison. What is happening? Well, I have spent the last few hours thinking over what might have gone wrong with this reaction, and I've come up with a few possibilities. I think one of the easiest things we can try to correct is how even the heat is applied to our reaction vessel. It's not generally a good idea to do what I have been, which is just take the beaker and slam it right on the hot plate like that. That provides uneven heat that uh, the bottom of the beaker will be much hotter than the top. And so that could have caused problems with the reaction. To fix this, I'll be doing the reaction in a little aluminum dish filled with some water to spread that heat more evenly. 
Now, if this doesn't fix the reaction, there's a couple more things that we might have to mess with. It could be that since I am using a weaker concentration of ammonia, it just might not be suitable for this. I might have to get the correct concentration used in this paper. I'll start with the simplest solution first, see what happens from there, and then worry about more drastic measures. Since we are changing one of the parameters, which is the evenness of the applied heat, I'm gonna go back to the initial test conditions with 41 milliliters of ethanol, just because I'm not co totally confident that that first test went to plan. The particles are large enough to be visible under the microscope, but they're not large enough to definitively see what shape they are. It could be that we didn't actually make microspheres or rather nanospheres with this technique. Now that we are up to temperature, I am also going to remove the thermometer from the actual reaction vessel just because I think, well, it's probably not interfering with the reaction, but why risk it? Well, this reaction is carrying on, I'm going to try setting my microscope up to shoot in dark field. I think that will make the nanoparticles much more visible. And this is apparently pretty easy. You just take a piece of cardboard and you have to cut like a, like a watch shape out of it, a circle with two straps coming out of the edges, and then you tape that onto the microscope filter. So let's give this a try and see how it looks. Okay, I just had to turn the camera back on because I've been sitting over here messing around with my microscope, trying to set up dark field to see our particles better. That was going terribly. And I looked down here at a sample that I took early out of this container, and it's starting to dry around the edges, and a flash of red caught my eye. <laughs> oh man, we have opal. Okay, let me bring another camera over here so I can show you this. Okay, I'm recording now. Let's see if I can catch the light the way my eye does. Can you see that? Uh, paper, let me, here, this is dark. This piece of paper is darker. Oh, I can just barely tell on camera that we get the littlest flash of red. Let me try to focus as close as possible. What is the closest I can focus with this lens? Oh! <laughs> ah! <laughs> no, okay. My first successful sample and I drop it on the floor and break the slide, oh man. Can we see the flash of red on this shard? <laughs> oh. Can you see that? Oh, it's just the slightest, the slightest flash of red. There we go. That, now we can see it on camera a little bit better when the flashlight's further away. <laughs> yeah! Yes! 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 Oh my gosh! <laughs> okay, I am sure this is so freaking boring on the camera. I mean, it's nothing. It's, it's the tiniest little flash of red from a mostly white substance. Wow, that... Yes! Yes! Oh, man. I feel like such a nerd. Holy crap. <laughs> wow. Oh, the sample is drying more and it's getting more of it is becoming opalescent. What am I doing? I need to throw out this little piece of glass. No, no, I don't need to throw it out. I will put it to the side, but I need to get another sample. I need to get a bigger sample and do this properly. Wow. Oh, and by the way, this means that our reaction method is suitable. I didn't have to do hardly anything except even out the temperature. Wow, that could not have been an easier fix. <laughs> okay, I spilled some of my opal on the side of my, uh, my fume hood here and the place where I spilled is opalescing. <laughs> Look at this. You see that red dot there? You see that? Red. Dude. <laughs> Suddenly, my week is made. I, my year might be made. Uh, <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that. I had a son this year. That should probably be the highlight 
uh, <laughs> of the past few months, but I spilled opal on my thermometer and it now has a red opalescent coating. What? This is the fanciest thermometer in the world. <laughs> How do I stop filling? What? Am I overdoing it yet? Taking beauty shots of a chemical spill on my thermometer <laughs> for the, the tiniest little pathetic color flash. And here is a sample that has finally dried on this little watch glass here. And now that we actually have a successful opal solution, first of all, we could uh, add pigment to turn this dark. We can maybe deposit the silicon dioxide onto natural stone so we get the look of a naturally formed opal on matrix. There is a lot we can do with this. Well, it is actually really convenient that this sample here ended up reflecting in a red wavelength because that means we have made nanospheres that are roughly uh, 350 to 400 nanometers in diameter. And that's the largest size we could be looking for. So from here, we just wanna go smaller and smaller. This is basically the far end of the curve. We don't wanna make them bigger than this or we'll start reflecting in the infrared. So before we go further, let me take a little sample of this to the microscope. And this time I'm actually going to mix in some yeast. I've put some yeast into a sample of water over here and that will give us a, uh, a standard size particle that we can look at under the microscope to compare the size of our produced nanospheres. So you can see the large spheres under the microscope. Those are the grains of yeast roughly three to four micrometers ac across, 3,000 to 4,000 nanometers, 10 times the size of the particles that we should have just made. And the smaller ones, of course, in the background are nanoparticles. This can't magnify enough to actually see that we've made spheres, but we must have because we are getting that red flash of color, and that can only be caused by an orderly stacking of spheres. So we have totally succeeded. This is a fantastic result. Interestingly, notice how the nanospheres are just bouncing around in the frame. They're like moving really dramatically and that is actually called Brownian motion. And you'll see an increase in that Brownian motion at higher temperatures. That's just the movement and the vibration of heat. It's pretty amazing. My sponsor for this video is Brilliant.org, where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, AI, and many other things. For me, the best part about Brilliant is that they make learning a new subject feel practical and intuitive with hands-on problem solving. They take a heavy focus not only on the subject at hand, but on building the mental tools needed to tackle learning of any kind. Chipping away at a course on brilliance is an easy way to keep your mind sharp and establish a habit of learning something new every day. Just one of the categories Brilliant has recently launched a ton of new courses on is data and probability. You can start with the basics of how to visualize data and the tools that can be used to interpret it, or jump right into advanced courses like multiple linear regression. There's something for people of all skill levels. You can try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days. And by using my link, brilliant.org forward slash Nighthawk, that will get you 20% off an annual premium subscription. You can find that link in the video description below. Well, now that I have achieved a lifelong dream, <laughs> where do we go from here? Uh, well, there are a number of other recipes in this paper. I picked a middle-of-the-road recipe. Whoa, okay, wait a minute. I thought that I was doing a middle-of-the-road quantity of ethanol. I was actually using the exact same quantity they used to achieve red. That is actually super interesting because I'm using a very different concentration of ammonia. If I can follow this paper to a T, what I should need in order to make green, well, I believe what was green, we should be able to go to 73 milliliters of ethanol. That's a pretty big step up compared to the 41 milliliters we just used to make red. 
I guess that's the next step. Let's try to go for a green particle. Let's put a new uh, container in our water bath here. So remember, we want to generate more nucleation sites in order to make smaller and smaller particles. And we're doing this chemically for this reaction. And so by adding more ethanol, we'll generate more nucleation sites and have smaller particles. All right, turn on the stirring, turn on the heat. In the meantime, I guess I can toss this sample since uh, I used less ethanol than the last one that was successful in the red spectrum. So I doubt nanospheres were formed at all in this actually, but if they were, they'd be of a size far too large to reflect visible light. <laughs> we actually saw that they were very small. So that, to that tells me that something went very wrong with this reaction. Uh, it's just a bad sample. Six mils of TEOS added. And let's wait for that color change. When I go to larger sizes, I'm gonna to have to use a bigger reaction vessel because we have just about maxed out the 100 mils when it's, uh, when it's stirring like this. Well, it did not take more than 10 or 20 minutes to make those red particles. So let's see if we are ready with the green here. I'll just take a small sample. See if we end up with green. <laughs> okay, we'll take a tiny little bit of yeast solution, and then we'll add a small sample of our green solution. I mean, they're visible, so they have to be fairly sizable. They should be in a, um, in a visible spectrum. That seems close enough to the red particles, unless they're, they're too large somehow. Well, as this green sample has been slowly drying, I've been peeking along the way, and it freaked me out a little bit. I saw the first color flash, and it was not green. It was red. How would I have made red again with a completely different ratio of chemicals? That doesn't make sense that it would still be the exact same particle size. And so I let it dry a little bit more, and suddenly the green appeared. But behind a flash of red. That is super weird, but it actually makes sense. Because if you think about how we talked about how an opal actually amplifies certain wavelengths of light, the first order wavelength is the one where it hits the surface of the crystals, it actually passes through that first layer of marbles and then bounces off the second layer. Passing through two layers will amplify double that wavelength. You get red and green out of the same sample. Future Ben here. <laughs> actually, have I introduced myself? Hi, I'm Ben from the future to explain my grave errors. <laughs> we have been talking, well, I have been talking as if I had just made a green opal. That's what I thought I made based on this paper, but that was because I looked at two different tables and compared them as if they were in the same order. They were not. I just made a blue opal without realizing it. Obviously, if you've seen the footage that I've just shown so far, there is an obvious blue flash behind the green color in these stones. And it's more obvious to the camera than it is with my eye. The blue doesn't stand out very well, maybe because it's near the ultraviolet range, which my eye doesn't see as well, and the camera maybe does. But also, it doesn't stand out as well against the white background of this opal. So we have made a blue opal already. And actually, that makes a lot more sense of the other wavelengths that we're seeing amplified, that being the green and the red. What I just said about the green amplifying a secondary wavelength of red doesn't make much sense because I was saying it was dependent on red being twice the wavelength of green. It's not. <laughs> I also made an error there. Blue light is approximately 400 nanometers, green light is approximately 500, and red light is approximately 700. These are not direct multiples of each other, but they're close enough that a blue stone is much more likely to reflect something that approximates green and through a third layer interaction, something that approximates red. Actually, I'm also simplifying here about the layer thing. It's not about which light passes through one layer or two layers or three necessarily. It could also be the angle we are viewing the stone from. This is a really complicated thing. And we can see that we make different colors just by the angle at which the stone is lit. That makes little sense if all we're talking about is light passing through multiple layers. 
Another thing is, since I didn't realize until this video was in editing that we had already made Blue Opal, part of what we'll explore in the rest of this video is another attempt to make a Blue Opal. Even the results of that failed experiment turned out pretty interesting. It could be that the milkiness of our samples is caused by, well, some kind of contamination left over from the chemical reaction. Remember, I didn't purify these nanoparticles at all. I simply took a dropper and threw them on a slide to dry. There could be other stuff that dried along with them that is contributing to the milky color. Or more likely, they are not perfectly stacked. The better these particles are actually stacked in an orderly way, well, the better they're gonna reflect the colors of light that we're looking for and the less white they will appear. They'll look more like glass with just some bright flashes of color glaring back at you. So now that we have actually made a few different colors of opal, there's a few more things I could do. First of all, I could let these settle out. Uh, this is my red sample and this one is green. If you let these sit for a number of weeks, they will form a solid opal at the bottom of these containers. And that opal should be of a much higher quality than what we end up with on a little slide like this. I could also throw these in my centrifuge and that would maybe settle them, well, it should settle them quite a bit faster, but I'm not sure how much faster. For now, I think I'm gonna start by making one more color. I at least wanna see a blue opal through this process. And then we might try some other methods to make this look like an actual stone. Now, while I make my blue opal, let's talk a little bit about how this might actually be practical for radiative sky cooling. How might this actually turn into free air conditioning? Radiative sky cooling is a really interesting property. Actually, everything on Earth has this property to some extent. It's why things get colder at night. They don't just hold onto the heat they gain from the sun forever. That heat is re-radiated into outer space in the form of infrared light. Some of this heat is absorbed by the atmosphere, and the atmosphere in turn then re-emits that light back towards the Earth's surface. This keeps objects on the Earth's surface warmer than they would normally stay, because the atmosphere is constantly circulating this infrared radiation. Now, an infrared sky cooling surface does not absorb or emit in that spectrum. That means that we are interacting directly with the coldness of outer space. On average, outer space is just barely above absolute zero. We're taking away the blanket. And so we actually can get free air conditioning simply by sending radiation directly into space. No blanket in between. This whole video, we have been tuning microspheres, nanospheres, to interact with very particular wavelengths. We can pick and choose where the light is emitted from these stones as well as received. That is a recipe for radiative cooling. You just need to find the right size sphere and you are going to have a very dramatic effect. As a matter of fact, we might not even need to use silica as you would for an ordinary opal. This same effect is possible using other compounds, like calcium carbonate, which we have already successfully used to make microspheres. If you haven't figured it out already, I'm filming this video without a script. So if I butchered some of the science in that little dialogue there, let me know in the comments below. It was probably unintentional. <laughs> Well, the blue solution is still cooking. It's actually taking significantly longer than the other ones did. So maybe that's where the, the time requirement of two hours came from in this paper. That might take two hours for those blue particles to finish forming. In the meantime, let's talk a little bit about how to turn this stuff into something that looks more like a stone. We have to get these particles to settle out. And because they're nanoparticles, and we saw that Brownian motion under the microscope, well, that motion is going to prevent these things from settling quickly. It's going to keep them in suspension for up to several months. It might take several months for something like a blue opal because those are a much smaller particle and are more affected by that Brownian motion. If you go small enough, the particles may never settle, not under natural gravity anyway. So to speed up this process, hopefully to only a few hours, we're gonna throw it in a centrifuge. So this is a very large centrifuge. Most are much smaller than this. 
Uh, the limit of this machine is that it has a fairly slow speed, only 4,000 RPM at its maximum setting, which for a centrifuge is very slow. You can get some that go all the way up to like 100,000 RPM. This will work well enough, hopefully, to cut our settling time down, at least for these larger particles. So what should I start with? Um, let's start with the red particles because that should go fastest. So let me open up my red sample here and I'm gonna actually mix this up even though I noticed that there was a few milliliters of headroom where the fluid was clear on top of this before which means our particles had actually started to settle after only about two days. It's very important that you get these things filled correctly or else the centrifuge will be out of balance. So here is 20 milliliters of our solution. Let me mark this, this is red. Now what we should get from this process is a crystal structure in the opal, which is much more ordered than when we evaporate them on a slide. The result from this sort of evaporation, actually there are a lot of currents, like, like literal currents, like rivers, flowing around in a substance as it rapidly evaporates, as it does off the top of a slide like this. Those currents keep the particles stirred up, too much for them to form any large, substantially sized crystals. And so you end up with tiny little specks of color, little teeny flashes, because that's the biggest flash you can get from the size of a tiny, tiny crystal. If you want larger flashes, big, broad flashes of color all at once, you need larger crystals. And for that, you need a more orderly packing formation. So hopefully we will get that from throwing these in the centrifuge and letting them settle out. Really, it will be much slower than when they are dried on a slide, but not quite so slow as a natural formation. So it'll be somewhere in the middle where we should have much larger flashes in our centrifuged opals, but maybe not quite so large as would be possible if we let these settle out naturally over months and months of time. One hour of time. And the vibrations are minimal, which means we have these tubes well balanced. If I had added just one milliliter of solution too much in one of those vials, this thing would be shaking off the table. <laughs> All right, this has been going for about an hour. Let's shut it down. And we'll see if our result is a settled opal. Ooh, this is nice and warm. <laughs> if I was right, whoa, look at how settled it is. Wow, I, I didn't expect that to work. What? Let's see, do we get a color flash? What was this? This was the green. Do we have any color flash in this? Or did it settle too fast? Okay, so one of the problems we might encounter with settling our opals this way is that we do it too quickly and that causes the particles to not be able to organize into a structured lattice, into those layers that we're looking for. And so we, we might lose out on color flash if we spin these tubes too quickly. Wow, that is incredible. I think what happened is I just drove these things out of solution way too fast and we lost our opalescence. We don't have an orderly structure to this because the particles were not given time to actually form into that even layer of marbles. So let's uh, shoot, what do I do? Part of the thing is we're relying on that Brownian motion, those intermolecular vibrations to help bring these particles into a orderly state as they come together. Probably the less Brownian motion you have, the longer of a settling time you want. Um, if you have more Brownian motion, you might be able to rush it, but you're probably not gonna end up with as good of a result as you otherwise might. So here we go. Wait, 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 <laughs> what am I doing? We're going too fast. Okay, about half the speed now. We should be at about uh, 2,000 or 3,000 RPM. As for my blue particles, I'm now also drying these on a slide while we wait. Test two with the centrifuge should be ready now. Uh, so let's take a look. Actually, shoot, I didn't label 
by process of elimination, this is the most recent red particle test. So let's see if we have color flash here. I'm not seeing it super apparently. Oh, and just by moving this vial around, I've broken the pellet a little bit. You can tell it looks just like a white pellet still. I was hoping for more transparency from the longer settling time, but I think maybe the centrifuge is still turned up too high. I need to turn it at a really low RPM and leave it for a few days, I think, instead of just a few hours. Let's take a look at the green. Look at back there, look at the out of focus, those out of focus test samples that have, have some of that color flash going on. <laughs> That's so cool. Is there any color flash? Oh, you see that? I see red. I do see a red flash. Okay, cool. So the color is still kind of subtle. Um, I was hoping for a brighter flash and I was hoping for a higher transparency in these opals. Well, that kind of worked. <laughs> it also kind of did not work. I think that we have some work to do here still and I already have some ideas to improve. So one thing that I definitely wanna try is adding some carbon black to the opal mixture. That should make a darker colored matrix so we don't actually have this, this uh, milky white color, which is actually a really bad background to be able to see color flash. If we add a little bit of carbon black into this, that carbon black should absorb a lot of that ordinarily reflected white light and it should leave only what is particularly amplified by the opal. This is actually kind of cool as these beakers are drying. Look at the, look at the color flash on the sides. Uh, this was the green beaker, this was the red, uh, but I think we're getting color flash not only maybe from the actual uh, nanospheres, but possibly some thin film interference or something, like the kind of thing that gives uh, soap bubbles their color. I'm not sure about that actually, it's, it's kind of interesting. We have blue over here and green here, kind of neat. In the meantime, my blue opal has dried here on the slide and I'm not seeing a very good blue flash. The actual color of this dried film on the slide does have a bluish hue, but it's not, it's not flashing like the other opal examples have. The last thing I wanna try in this video is to see if we can make a black opal. So to do that, I will take what's left over of my green compound here, and I'm going to mix into this some carbon black. If I mix this along with the nanospheres, it should darken the opal in general, which should make the color flash a lot brighter. We'll start with just the, the tiniest little quantity of this lamp black. Because lamp black is molecularly fine, it tends to clump a lot. If we mix this well enough, the lamp black should not disturb the opal structure at all because it's, it's molecularly small. It's way smaller even than nanoparticles. So it'll just sit in between those spheres and darken the opal so that the color flash shows up better. This might take a while. I might have to think of a more powerful way to stir this, maybe with my drill press. Uh, we'll see. I'm going to cut the cameras and you'll see me again when this is fully mixed. Uh, <laughs> well, you can see I had a bit of a problem with the uh, lamp black. Uh, I was noticing that it was settling toward the bottom. And so I thought, well, if I add a ton, uh, maybe what finally divides enough to stay in suspension will actually color the solution. Well, anything that's too big will settle to the bottom and I can just pull the liquid off the top almost all of it settled to the bottom, so that ended, didn't end up being a good plan. I don't know that this, uh, this carbon black is actually a good colorant uh, for an opal. Instead, I have some of this alcohol ink, and so this is an alcohol-soluble ink, and if I drip some of this in here, it should actually color the liquid. There we go. Now that, that should stay in suspension. All right, let's give it a stir. Well, <laughs> we'll find out. Now I need to let that, that carbon black settle out again. While I pipe this solution into a dish here to try to make 
our dark opal. I want to talk to you for a second just about the status of this channel and thank those of you who have supported me on Patreon. A few months ago, I was considering how I might include some of the things I've done on this channel in a resume, as I really was not feeling very much stability in the income of this channel. And you guys really stepped up, especially since I've been doing my radiative cooling series. I've tripled my Patreon support. You have tripled my Patreon support. Thank you for that. It has caused me to be able to stop looking at other options. So thank you to everyone who supports this channel. If anyone else would like to chip in on Patreon, I'd appreciate you checking it out. Don't go there and try to support me if you yourself are strapped for cash. That is not what this is about. This is if you have a little extra income and you think that what I'm doing here is valuable or at least entertaining, educational. We have a lot of fun on this channel also, but hopefully even during the fun projects that lack the hard science, we still learn a lot of things along the way. While I was waiting for these darkened samples to dry, I did a few other things. So first of all, I made another mixture uh, which should end up to be a green shade as well. And I poured it into these test tubes so that I can actually let these sit and naturally settle out over the course of the next few weeks to months. And we'll see if we actually end up with a solid crystal opal in the bottom. The color flash in that should be much better than in the centrifuge. Another thing I discovered while the camera was off is exactly what is happening with the milky appearance of the dried opal. It's because there is air in between the nanospheres. And I know this for sure, because if I take a little bit of nail polish and coat some of the spheres, do you see that? It goes crystal clear. Look at that. Look at how clear it is where I put nail polish over the coating. Now, as far as the dark samples go, I'm having a little bit of an issue where there isn't much opalescence once they dry. While it's still damp, we're starting to get some serious opal flash in the wet mixture. And at the same time, it's transparent. So there we have it. We have water filling the gaps, in this case, between the nanospheres, and that is causing transparency in addition to the color flash. So we really just need to find the right substance that can do this, but retain its solidity. So we end up with a flashy, colorful opal that is also transparent. So darkening the opals in this way seems like a bit of a failed experiment. We'll have some more work to do in future videos on that topic. Well, this video might be a part one of two, maybe more than that, because not only do we have the radiative cooling series to explore in that aspect of opal technology, but I also want to make a more beautiful stone than what we accomplished in this video so far. I want to make a crystalline opal, one that looks just completely transparent, except for those color flashes inside. That is my ideal opal. I think that's the most beautiful form and a stone that I would really love to say I was able to make myself. That would be so cool. So we have some things to still explore in this project. Let me know in the comments if you have ideas or what you'd like to see me do with this opaline substance. We could of course deposit it in any number of ways. And that itself could be a cool video, putting it into inlay on a guitar or just on various stones, jewelry, all kinds of cool stuff. If we can make a higher quality one, all the better. So let me know in the comments what you think. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.